Chevy Impala, icon reinvented or still grandpa's car. Yeah. Add power and torque to your car, Celso, in under an hour. This won't hurt a bit. <laughs> a Range Rover for 007. Five cars for losers. Time to check the tech. We see cars differently. We love them on the road and under the hood, but also check the tech and are known for telling it like it is. The good, the bad, the bottom line. This is CNET on Cars. Welcome, I'm Brian Cooley, and this is CNET on Cars, the show all about high-tech cars and modern driving. And I'm willing to bet that until very recently, the Chevy Impala held no interest for you unless you're either a low rider, my grandfather, or work at Avis. But I'm happy to report that as of the 2014 model, the Chevy Impala is something entirely different and ready for its first ever review on CNET. Let's check the tech. Now this is a part of our video where I normally tell you how to spot the car in question. That's easy on this one, just open your eyes. This car looks nothing like that previous Impala, that dough ball queen of the rental lot. This car has angles and creases, kind of a rear haunch sloping forward design, a little bit of Camaro, a little bit of Malibu, and hotness all over it. They've done a nice job with this vehicle. Now inside the Impala, we have what is known in the common American vernacular as fancy. Unfortunately, GM traditionally can't help themselves in confusing luxurious with gaudy. So I see a lot of overly polished plaster wood and excessively wide chrome strips all over this thing, but that's just how they do it. Now the star of the show, as you probably noticed, is this eight inch Chevy MyLink head unit. This is your audio, your media, weather, Pandora, your OnStar is now graphically controlled, not just in those mirror buttons that still exist up here. And the trick that everyone loves is push the button. You've seen this on TV, probably will push it and hold it. And the screen goes up and there you have a little secret bin for your mobile device and it can also charge on that USB port, which is also a connection for media. Now when I go to the navigation system, you find the first indication of what continues used to pop up throughout this rig, which is very slow response. This unit seems to be overwhelmed by the processing chores it has to do. That tells me not enough CPU or not optimized code. Just trying to zoom out is a push again and again experience. If you want to enter a destination, you can press that button there. Oof, no thanks. I prefer to use the voice command, which is actually pretty advanced on this car. You're able to tell it an address as the number, the street, and the city in one go. That's nice. And you get good prompts in the center screen, and you sometimes get the similar prompts on the main screen. So there's a lot of visual support, so you know what it wants you to say and can get the task done and get back to driving. Street address. Say the address in California, or say change state, or... 235 2nd Street, San Francisco. Two, three, five, second. Yes. Complete your selection from the radio display. Now here's where it gets long and sluggish. For some reason it's transferring from that screen to this screen and taking forever. And I was told to wait and look over here and now continue my confirmation of the navigation. That's where things start to break down. So I hit my address to go there. For some reason it took me to the Pacific Ocean. I don't know what's going on. The audio sources are pretty straightforward. Nothing goofy, everything solid. So you've got lots of USB ports. You saw the one up in here, right? I've got two more down here in the console. You can run three USB devices at once. Other media choices include my streaming Bluetooth phone, of course. Uh, there's AM, FM, satellite, and HD radio on this guy. And Pandora works quite seamlessly. Once your phone's paired, boom, it just works. Nice meta tags, good album art, very clear controls. They've done a good job on that. Now let's talk about driver control technology. First of all, you see our shifter here, one choice only, six speed automatic. There is a manual position, but not a sport mode. But when you get in there, you don't have paddles to shift on this car ever. You use this little dainty rocker switch on top of the knob. I never liked that. Now we have all the driver assistance tech in this car, which includes rear view camera, which is optional by the way. It should be standard on a car of this level in this price. We have a lane departure warning, but it won't correct anything. We'll check that on the road. We have blind spot indications. Again, there's no correction, just that little light goes off. And we also have forward collision warning, which will tell you when you're closing on someone too fast, but again, won't do anything about it. And we also have rear sonar for parking along with that optional camera, and that combines also for cross-traffic alert to avoid getting T-boned when you're backing out. 
Now under the hood, the Impala is unusual. The only car in its class where you can get a four-cylinder. Two and a half liter direct injection modern motor, but you won't find that on Taurus or a Zara or its other competitors. We don't have it though. We have the big boy right now, the V6 that is 3.6 liters, direct injection, variable valve timing, output is 305 horsepower, 264 foot pounds of torque. This car weighs 3,800 pounds or so, gets up to 60 in 6.8 seconds thereabouts. So not bad, certainly no slow. Now the MPG is 1828, but an average of just 21, kind of thirsty, which brings up an interesting point. There will be later in production the availability of a 2.4 liter Eco Assist mild hybrid. We've driven that engine before, not anything quite this big, but it could be an intriguing motor. It's actually kind of a nice one, and it could take care of the thirstiness here. We'll see about that. Let's go for a ride. Let it be said, the Impala's V6 engine's got gobs of good stuff if you put it in manual and sift through the gears, but if you leave it to the automatic, everything is muted. The shifts are relatively buttery, they're not urgent, and therefore the engine doesn't feel urgent, although I think it is, the powertrain isn't because of the transmission. Now the ride quality is excessively smooth and the steering is kind of numb and over assisted. All of this is, as a, you can tell, adding up to a lot of the uh, DNA from the old Impala, kind of bleeding through. General Motors still thinks this car is apparently selling to the same audience it used to sell to, which I find a little surprising for all the work they've done on it. Now out on the open road, the lane departure warning system is calibrated a little, a little lazily for my taste is the best way to put it. It doesn't seem to sound the warning until you're already on or well over the line most of the time on the freeway. That to me kind of defeats the purpose. The forward collision warning does have the three settable levels and it is actually a pretty meaningful tech. It seems to do a pretty good job. Although I'm happy to report, I rarely found it doing its job while I was driving, which is good. And all this car feels like a much more quality piece than the previous Impala, which is actually high praise. I find the outgoing Impala to be, while well, highly uninspiring, an actually uh, very serviceable, very well built car, if not much in terms of concept. Okay, let's price our 2014 Impala. This guy's a 2LT. That's basically the mid-trim level. Nice, but not everything is in there. So we start adding on. $1,095 to get that MyLink head unit with navigation. That's a must to go see that style. Now, as I mentioned, you gotta also package up if you want a rear camera. That makes me grip my teeth, but you gotta do it. That's called the convenience package, rear cam, rear sonar, automatic mirror, home link. It's a little under a thousand bucks. Now the steal of the day is their driver assistance package. For only 890 bucks, you get the forward collision warning, the cross traffic alert, the lane departure warning, the blind spot warning. That's kind of a deal. So all in, we're somewhere shy of $36,000. Nicely equipped, but not top of the line. How does the Impala fare overall? This is not a driver's car, but it's a nice driving car. Know what I mean? It's not going to appeal to a dramatically different market than the one that left it, but it's now a seriously good competitor against the Taurus, the 300, the Azera, and the Toyota Avalon. All of which, by the way, have been refreshed lately. It's a very competitive space, but this guy can hold its own. Check out the full details of our Impala review over at cars.cnet.com. Oh, by the way, the previous Impala will continue production alongside the new one as a fleet car for civil servants and you unlucky rental customers. You know, tire technology's changed a lot over the years, except for one thing that they still do like in the old days. They pick up nails and screws and go flat. And then you're on the side of the road showing the world the crack of your ass doing this, changing a filthy tire on a wheel unless you have run flats, and they're of interest to the smarter driver. Now, run flat tires are kind of amazing. They can be driven underinflated or uninflated at up to freeway speeds, 55 miles an hour or so is recommended, up to 200 miles in some cases, depending on the tire. How they do that's interesting. Here's a conventional tire, and if I get on the sidewalls here, I can deflect them. You've probably done this with an old tire laying around, even on a swing when you were a kid. Come over here to a run flat, though. Try and deflect that sidewall. You'll break your thumb trying to do it. Extremely strong sidewall structure this way, as well as laterally. This thing has sidewalls of steel, quite literally, and can support the weight of the car without any air inside helping out. That's what makes it work. Roadside, 
When you get a flat with a run-flat tire, you won't be out there on the side of the road trying to change a wheel, which you may have never done before. The side of the highway is no place to learn a new mechanical skill. Blowouts. Run flats are pretty much immune to sudden pressure loss. Even without air, they pretty much maintain their shape. In fact, the first indication anything is wrong may come from the tire pressure alert on the dash, not the feel of the steering wheel. Space and weight. Run flats allow car makers to use the space formerly taken by the spare for something better, like the battery in the case of this BMW, and loses the weight of that spare wheel, tire, and jack. Now the cons. Run flat tires tend to cost more and weigh more. Two things you don't want in a tire. First of all, the cost. Easily 20-25% more than a conventional tire of about the same size. I'm ballparking there, but that's not unusual. And that's a big price difference. Secondly, the weight. You can't feel this, but if I pick up this run flat, it's really dense. This similar tire that is conventional and about the same size is actually dramatically lighter. And that will change the dynamics of how your vehicle handles and rides. Less weight is always better in any part of your wheels, brakes, tires, or suspension arms. Harder to find. You may not find a run flat in your size sitting on the shelf when you need one. So while the run flat may get you to the nearest service station easily, you might spend a long time waiting there. The CNET CarTech team has reservations about being stuck with the limited tire selection when you have run flats. Hondas and Acuras that came with Michelin Pax run flats, for example, can only use those tires unless you do a complete change that could include wheels, tires, and tire pressure sensors. And a recent JD Power survey found that owners of performance-oriented cars with run flats are only half as likely to recommend their tire brand to someone else. The weight and feel tend to deaden the car's handling. Honda was an early user of run-flat tires, but they used a different system than this, something called the Michelin Pax technology. It was a hard plastic shell that lived inside the tire and supported it. Uh, same basic idea, but they bailed out in 2009. Don't put those on cars anymore. That leaves BMW, Mini, and some Corvettes as the main users today of the stiff sidewall technology like I've showed you. Uh, that actually is not enough to make an industry-wide revolution. What did replace the run-flat or keep it from really getting to fruition were better technology for traditional spares, which we've covered, actually, if you go look at episode 19. Want more power and torque? A new air intake might do it. We'll install one when CNET on Cars continues. Welcome back to CNET on Cars. I'm Brian Cooley. If you've ever lifted your hood, and if you watch this show, you better have, you've seen one of these, a big old plastic housing with a flexible rubber snoot coming off it. This is your air intake. And while that sounds pretty mundane, realize that changing this can change the personality of almost any engine. It makes for a great CarTech 101. Now, there are two main reasons you put an air intake kit in your car. The first one is to optimize airflow. That is to make sure the engine is never starved for the air it needs to combine with fuel. The second reason is to get a cooler temperature on that air. Let's start with the optimized airflow. You need to make sure that breathing is free because there is so little time for a cylinder to be filled. Between 0.02 and 0.006 seconds, depending on the engine's RPM. Anything impeding that airflow means it doesn't completely fill the cylinder with air and gas, and that is reduced volumetric efficiency. When it comes to cooling the air, that is important too because if you recall from high school science class, Cooler air is denser air. Denser air has more oxygen molecules in a cubic inch. More oxygen combines better with the fuel to get more power out of every time you fill and fire the cylinder. This is what air intake kits are all about. Now, of course, I'd love to install an air intake kit or just about anything on an F40, but I don't think it needs the help. However, our photographer Celso has an 06 Tahoe with the big V8. It could use the help. Let's do it. Bring it in. Here we go. Don't lose a mirror. <laughs> you got it. Well, you just got it. Okay. Looks good. Celso, this won't hurt a bit. <laughs> okay, we'll start by removing the factory air intake system, which you can see is a whole lot of plastic dreck. Okay, first thing in the airflow is this air box right here. This is where the air filter lives. I'm gonna disconnect the mass airflow sensor. And then if I lift this off and pull off the lid here, 
This is your traditional air filter, which is this sort of pleated paper thing. You can't see through that, right? I mean, you're going to see a big difference when I put the new one in. This is rather dense, and air gets through here rather slowly. And down here is the bottom where that thing sits, and I want you to see this. These are the intake nozzles on the old air box, and notice what they breathe through. A couple of holes punched in the sheet metal here on the inside fender well. It gets air from basically down the right side of the fender. It's a little bit occluded because the air's got a tortured 90 degree path to make up a narrow channel here. So that's going to improve our airflow right there by getting rid of this turn, this corner. Okay, now I pull off the electronic connector for what's called the mass airflow sensor. That's this guy right here. Let me try and remove that because this part we're going to keep. A mass airflow sensor, you can just see right through there. It's got a screen to bring down turbulence on the front, and then on the back, it's got electronic vanes that can measure the volume of air that is rushing across this thing. It's the first piece of electronics that tell the engine how much air is on its way to the throttle body, which is where the real intake begins. We're going to put this back in. Now, the last big piece we got to get rid of is this big kind of ductwork, this plastic plenum. I've loosened it up from the throttle body right there. You can look in there and see the big butterfly valve, which is the beginning of the fuel air mixture chain. We're not going to screw with that. That's serious stuff. But this is a large, very convoluted thing that has all kinds of warming and cooling chambers in it, which we're going to get rid of. And this may change some of the cold weather behavior of the vehicle. Okay, so what we've done now is we've removed this big kind of occluded air box with that pleated filter and we've built up this heat shield. This is going to be our new replacement for the air box and I've mounted the mass airflow sensor on it. And this thing just sits down on some studs here. Notice how much more of a free breathing apparatus it is than what came out. Okay. And now from the heat shield and mass airflow sensor, we're going to put on this little coupling that's getting us to the other key part of this. A great big pipe, big diameter, very gentle curve, and not a bunch of chambers off of it where uh, turbulence can build up and impede the flow into the throttle body. So all in, this will take you about an hour. It's not a difficult job. It's one that requires that you fit and pre-fit things to make sure that the clearances are all good. An important two points, keep all your old parts just in case, and secondly, don't leave anything inside this apparatus, not a washer, not a nut, nothing, because after the filter, there's no other gatekeeper that keeps things from being sucked into the engine. The fastest way to a $10,000 bad weekend is to suck a nut or a washer into your head. Now, parts like this always have these hot rod stickers that come with them. I don't stick them on my car. Instead, I use them as a contact gauge. Take a piece of it, put it upside down here with the sticky side up, and then pull your hood down if you want to check clearance. And if it doesn't stick to the top of the hood, you know, you've got at least a little bit of an airspace there and you're not rubbing on the underlayment and the heat shield. Okay, now the last part, which is putting in the only service element and the coolest looking part. Well, Maybe that pipe is, and that is the air filter. Notice how different that is from what came out. Completely different shape. This guy you can't see through. This guy, it's a little hard to tell, but if you look inside here, far more breathable. This is an oil impregnated material, so it's not as thick because the oil helps to draw dirt out. You service this thing once in a blue moon, you wash it and re-oil it. Probably almost never. Let's put this guy in and see how this thing runs. Okay, our filter is snugged up, so let's see what we've accomplished. We've nailed all of our goals by getting a much more cool and unobstructed airflow. Cooler here because we have a metal heat shield, a little more air around it. It's not so obstructed because it's not coming out of this tortured little turn here in the fender well. Graceful, large diameter pipe. So overall, we should have a cooler, easier flowing intake to get to the throttle body and into the mechanicals of the engine. But let's see if it drives or sounds any different. So we're on the freeway. You hear oh, it, This is different. Wow. <laughs> what are you hearing? More Ooh, the, ooh, yeah. 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 Sounds this good. is right? definitely different. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's because you know that big cone filter we put mm -hmm. in there. There's not just air going into it, but there's also noise coming back through it. So engine noise that was normally trapped. It's a good sound. Yeah. yeah. Very different. Yeah. Here we are, 3,000 RPM. We get a chance. Open it up a little bit. See if you feel any more power, any more torque. It says right here, this kit's guaranteed to increase horsepower. So, <laughs> I mean, this is what I think is the placebo effect. People put these things in and they go, oh yeah, it feels faster. 
That's it, so right there. Yeah. And a little more torque. I mean, you also might find a little better gas mileage. Not dramatic. Okay. And a one or two MPG, maybe, if you're really monitoring your gas mileage carefully. I guess for a car this size, it's always anything in it. <laughs> anything else. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Kuli. How so? Sounds good. Pleasure's mine. You got my usual 30 30 guarantee. You got 30 it. yards or 30 minutes. We've <laughs> actually passed both, so you're out of warrant. <laughs> Now here's why Celso didn't find his Tahoe is night and day different after putting in the intake kit. These are dyno results from a vehicle like his with a kit like that. Here's horsepower going up from 249 to 257. That's not night and day. Here's the torque difference, 245 to 253 foot-pounds. Again, a little over eight foot-pounds or so, but notice on both of these, the improvement is on the high end of the RPM range where factory intake systems tend to make the engine run out of air. That's very common. This helps address that. This is really good for high RPM run. Oh, by the way, Celso grabbed me in the hallway the other day and said he's actually feeling the power and torque improvement since we put that air kit on more and more as he drives the vehicle. So that's good news, as is the fact that no parts have fallen off yet. You know, the new Range Rover Sport was introduced by Daniel Craig, driving it through the streets of Manhattan. An interesting little press stunt, a nice nod to his alter ego, but it made it clear we needed to get to know the car through equally British eyes. The guys at X-Car have that handled for us. In 2005, Land Rover launched a new type of car, a proper sports utility vehicle, a car that was designed to go like stink, handle well, and still be able to tackle the wilderness as well as its siblings. It was a Range Rover GTI of sorts. It was called the Range Rover Sport. And now there's a new one in town. Land Rover says it's better than its dad in nearly every single way. Does that mean it can like dunk better or something? The full fat Range Rover is for ferrying execs and the elite from A to B through whatever terrain they encounter, whereas the Sport is more for going out and having a little bit of fun. This new one, thanks to its all aluminium construction, weighs up to 420 kilos less than the old one. Now that means three things. One, fewer emissions. Two, better MPG. And three, more speed. All versions of the Sport have been designed to give the best on-road dynamics of any Range Rover ever. If you're going to take the plunge, it would also be a shame to miss out on the 5-litre supercharged V8. Because over 500 brake horsepower twinned with all the engineering in this thing, it's fun. This thing is not been in a straight line. <laughs> Catastrophic speed aside, I mean, this really is like sort of Range Rover GTI. You sit a lot lower in the cabin. You're more ensconced by the cockpit. Everything is very close to hand. I'm loath to say like you're in a sports car because you're not. You're in quite a tall SUV, but it feels quite light and quite quick. It's quite a strange experience, really. You don't expect something like this to have quite the turn of pace it does and that's especially thanks to the car's dynamic mode. It does have the terrain response system that you get in a Range Rover and an Evoque, but as this is a sport, it's important to concentrate on dynamic mode. What dynamic mode does is it basically sharpens everything up. So the steering gets a bit heavier and the throttle response gets a bit better. Everything sort of goes on to tent, ready to pounce mode. And if you stick the gearbox into sport, and the gearbox is an absolutely beautiful eight-speed automatic, well, you've got yourself a pretty racy little car. It'll do naught to 60 in five seconds. And this thing weighs around two and a half tons. It's just, it's disgustingly fast. It actually offends me a little bit, especially if you add in the noise of that V8.
The Sport is set up for awesome on-road driving, that's its thing, but it's actually a car of two faces. You see, Land Rover offers two four-wheel drive systems with this, one for off-road and one for on-road, the latter of which, incidentally, weighs 18 kilos less than the off-road one. If you're an idiot and have very little off-road experience, you can just put the terrain response into auto, stick the gearbox into low range and drive it through a riverbed or up a verge, it'll look after you so it doesn't break itself and you don't die. While it's just as capable, it's not as refined. This one's a bit more noisy, a bit more engaging, a bit more sort of visceral. It grabs you by the scruff of the neck and goes, no, this is a sports SUV. You're actually going to use me for sporty stuff. And that's where the difference lies between this and the Range Rover. But that leaves me with a question. Is it a bit of a shot in the foot? You see, this will do everything the Range Rover will do off-road. It's set up for on-road driving as well, and it's a bit quicker. It's better on fuel. You can have more seats in there and seat more people, and it's smaller, so it'll be just that little bit easier to park. But what the Range Rover does over the Sport is have a little bit more elegance. Where a Range Rover is comfortable everywhere in the world, the Sport, well, it's a bit more cineplex than Colosseum. Coming up, the worst selling cars ever and the tech that helped put them there as CNET on Cars rolls on. The English have long had a thing for tiny cars. This pear drop was probably a one-off, apparently not weighing more than a dumbbell, nor driven by anyone but one. The original Mini Cooper makes today's Mini look like a monster truck by comparison. It presents no parking difficulty whatever. The Peel P50 has a handle on the back, not to open it, but to pick it up. But the smallest is the Periwinkle car, fashioned from the body of a kid's ride. It tops out at 40, so the flames are a little optimistic. Yes, the Mura. Didn't sell a lot of copies, but that was by design. Unlike the cars in our top five list today that were intended to sell a lot and didn't. Largely because their tech or engineering was crap. Makes for an interesting list and an interesting set of lessons. Okay, let's start here with the Plymouth Prowler. 8,200 total sales. The Prowler was advanced for its heavy use of bonded aluminum construction, but they wasted that tech on those absurdly over-posturing outboard wheels with pontoon fenders. That's an IndyCar cue, guys. You should back that up with more than a V6 and a four-speed automatic. Number four, the Pontiac Aztec. I know, predictable, 5,020 sold. I hate to pile on, but the Aztec was a mess. Its high-tech look of conflicting body panels and glass panels and weird angles was awful and one of the first cars developed primarily on a computer. Maybe if they had done more physical mock-ups, they would have come in the office one day and seen this thing and gone, gah, and killed it. Being number four on my list, about the kindest comment it ever earned. Number three, the Studebaker Avanti, 4,600 sold. It pains me to put the Avanti on here, but it was a dud. The Raymond Lowy team designed a hot looker with rare front discs and an optional supercharger, all good tech. But the complexity of the fiberglass body eluded Studi. Production delays led to canceled orders, led to the canceling of the company. Number two, the Lincoln Blackwood, 3,300 sold. This ghetto fabulous take on the F-150 turned the bed into a carpeted, power-lidded trunk that you couldn't really access. Basically, it neutered a perfectly good pickup, offered it to you in only one color, and charged you 50 grand for the honor. Chevy's Avalanche sold circles around it by being oddly innovative in a more useful way. The number one dud seller with wacky tech was the Studebaker Wagonaire, 940 sold. It's a collectible these days. This oddball was a wagon with a roof that retracted from the rear to the front, leaving you with kind of a ranchero, but with high sides. What do you carry in there? And how do you load it without making your chiropractor rich? Add in the fact that that complicated roof leaked like a rainforest, and this was a piece of engineering before its time. 
I'm not sure a car maker could pull it off today. Hope you enjoyed the show. Remember, past episodes are at CNETOnCars.com along with our feed links so you don't miss anything in the future. And as always, email me oncars at CNET.com. See you next time.